So uh, now let us uh, move on to the next, the next one on this list. Uh, Okay, so there again we are uh, looking at the noble search, uh, and uh, so this is the uh, the last one of these uh, uh, variety of problems that we're dealing with. Is when someone who is themselves liable to become corrupted, uh, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to become corrupted, uh, seeks the freedom from corruption, supreme sanctuary from the bondage uh, extinguishment. Uh, yeah, so freedom from corruption here does not mean what you normally mean. It, it means here the freedom from the corruptions of the mind. The sankilesa or uh, uh, kilesa is a word very commonly heard in Buddhist circles in the sutta as it's usually sankilesa or upakilesa, not kilesa. So we want to uh, see the danger uh, in being liable to become corrupted. Uh, yeah, so what do you reckon? Are you, are you liable to become corrupted or not? Uh, <laughs> it's hard to know, right? It's hard to really feel that. Uh, and this is one of those very interesting things about uh, the Dhamma or about how we think about ourselves. Uh, it is different to see ourselves as different from what we actually are right now. Uh, we think that the way we are now is the way we will be in the future. Uh, and it's difficult to think of yourself as corrupted, yeah. Difficult to think of yourself as a person who is full of anger if you are quite peaceful and have good qualities. It's difficult to think of yourself as very greedy if you are a person who is quite contented with life. Difficult to see yourself as deluded if you have a fairly clear mind. It's difficult to see how we can change. And for this reason, this is again a very important point to understand how uncertain it is what kind of person we actually are and how easily we can change. And uh, I, I don't know if I spoke about this when I was here last year, probably did, I've spoken about most of these things before, but uh, one of those little pieces of research I found very interesting, which I came across a while ago, uh, this was researchers who asked people uh, about their ability to see change. Yeah? And uh, so what they did, they said, well, think of yourself what you were like 10 years ago. And so these people, they said, yeah, oh, yeah, 10 years ago, I was a very different person, yeah. I didn't come to the BGF 10 years ago, and I was kind of surrounded by all these kind of dodgy people, and they were leading me astray and all of these kind of things, yeah. Then I heard about the BGF, and I started coming there, I became a better person. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, so we can, sometimes we can see the shift in ourselves, how we become better, how we actually change over time, especially when you look into the past, we can see that shift. And you can see how you have been shaped by the currents and the forces around you. And especially if we are Buddhist, then the, many of those currents and forces will be Buddhist ideas. And they shape our lives. And they give us a certain direction. And often we become better people. Some people become worse, but some, many people become better people as a consequence. And you can see the change, yeah? And so they did this test and they asked people and they could see that change in their life. Uh, but then they asked the same people, well, now look into the future. Uh, what do you see here? And there, nobody could really see change anymore. Uh, yeah, the future, once they're looking into the future, it's like, yeah, oh yeah, it will roughly be the same. Yeah, it will be like I'm now, I maybe I will earn a little bit more money and I will probably go to the BGF every week instead of just once a month. Yeah, and uh, so it was basically the same, maybe a slightly enhanced version of your present self. Yeah, they couldn't see change coming here. Yeah? And so this is actually why the contemplation of impermanence, including the contemplation of death, the contemplation of everything must change around us, why it is so important. Yeah, because actually it is very, very difficult to see. Yeah? And this is also why our very sense of who we are, and the reason why it is so hard to see change is because of our sense of self. Our sense of self has this permanent aspect to it. And because this is who we are, yeah, that if you are something, of course, it has to continue because otherwise you aren't that person. And so the sense of self blocks our ability to, to see change. But change actually is a very 
is always there, always under the surface, uh, always waiting to come through, waiting for all the cause and conditions to fall into place. And then it erupts. And then you have wars in Ukraine. You have people dying. You have illnesses. You have, suddenly you hang out with the wrong crowd and you become a criminal. You know what I mean? I probably don't know what, what I mean because it's kind of unlikely. You will become, but it can happen, right? People become criminals in this life. And I hope it doesn't happen to me. That would be <laughs> And so we change, yeah? And this is the corruption of ourselves as human beings. We become corrupted. Yeah? And it is un unavoidable that in this uh, long kind of sequence of lives of ours, there will be lives where we are more corrupted uh, and lives where we are less corrupted. Yeah? And it will come back to you eventually, yeah? yeah? And you get reborn in some kind of gangster family. Yeah? Are the gangsters here in Malaysia? Yeah, yeah they are. Okay, yeah, I don't know anything about them. Malaysian gangsters, but I'm sure they are. Sure they are. There are gangsters everywhere. It seems to be an inevitable part of human society. Gangsters are everywhere. Yeah? And sometimes you will also be a gangster. Yeah. 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 That's what happens. Uh, yeah, because that's just the way things are. Uh, sometimes you get reborn into a gangster family. Yeah? And when you get reborn as a gangster family, you become a gangster because you have to follow what they say because you're still attached to your family. You still, they, they say you must kill, you must steal, you will kill and steal. You must deal drugs, you will deal drugs, yeah? Because that's what they do. And this is kind of, you, you have no choice because otherwise they will kick you out of the family and you will be incredibly lonely. Yeah? I heard some cases of the mafia in Italy, uh, the Italian mafia, world famous gangsters. Uh, and uh, some of those people, they, were, you know, they decided no longer to be gangsters uh, and they got completely ostracized. They didn't have any friends anymore. And they kind of had a really miserable life as a consequence. Uh, so it's very hard to give these things up once you're part of it. And so this is a, a very important point. Yeah? This is very important to remember that we have this opportunity now in this life to purify ourselves. And if you don't take that opportunity to do something about yourself, all of these bad things will come back. And they will come back with a vengeance. Yeah, much worse. You don't know what's going to happen in your next life. Is there going to be any Buddhism left in your next life? Where are you going to get reborn anyway in your next life? Do you know where you're going to get reborn? I don't know. Maybe if, what happens if you get reborn in Afghanistan? Yeah. And if you, go, if you get reborn in Afghanistan and you say you are a Buddhist, not a very good idea. Yeah, because you might not be lived for that much longer if you say you're a Buddhist in Afghanistan. So we don't know. And anyway, Buddhism is getting more and more corrupted anyway. By, as we speak, it's getting corrupted. Less and less people have the real teachings. Uh, yeah? So what happens when Buddhism is gone? Uh? And it's like going back to the dark ages from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, no one is really seeing the light. Uh, no one really understands what's going on. Uh, the Buddha is the eye in the world. And when that eye in the world is completely gone because the suttas are no longer here, we are in darkness. Uh, yeah? That's kind of a bit that's concerning. Uh. It doesn't take long before you start doing all kind of dodgy things. Uh, you become corrupted again. Uh. So the sense of urgency arises out of thinking in this way. Now is the chance to do what is right. Now is the chance to be kind. Now is the chance to appreciate my fellow spiritual companions. Now is the chance to appreciate the coffee that someone gives you. Look at this. I give this coffee all the time. Isn't that great? It's beautiful. One of the great things about being a monk is that people are very kind to you usually. It's true. It's something that I think often is underestimated. Yeah, you become a recipient of a large amount of kindness. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing to be a monk when that happens. Uh, and, so you, uh, and so I should never forget that. Uh, yeah. Okay, note to self. Don't forget the kindness. Uh. <laughs> Someone gives me coffee. Yeah, these little things like this are really beautiful because uh, it gives you an insight into the uh, positive aspect of humanity when you see all these good things. Uh. So out of that, I'm going to have a sip of coffee just to, not, not because I like coffee, just because. <laughs> no. mm. Okay, that's very good. Huh? So, um, uh, so this is the idea, yeah, of understanding that you are uh, subject to corruption. And it's a very kind of scary prospect, uh, and so you want to be free from those things? Now is the opportunity here. All right, let's move on now. 
So here we have the uh, Buddha speaking again. And he says to the monks, to the mendicants, uh, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened, but intent on awakening, uh, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what is also liable to be reborn. Yeah, so uh, before the Buddha's awakening, uh, while he was intent on awakening, uh, while he was a bodhisattva, a translation of bodhisattva that you, some of you have never heard before, uh, because some of you will still think that bodhisattva means bodhisattva, and it, it, that is to be understood as someone who practiced for four incalculable eons and became a Buddha. That's probably what you think, but uh, this is probably more likely the correct translation. This is what it means, bodhisattva. It means intent on awakening. Uh, and it's what happens in the Buddha's last life, when he left the household life, uh, from the time he left the household life until he reached awakening. Uh, that is the bodhisattva. And he did not probably not practice for four incalculable eons. That's more like a later legend and mythology, uh, and not actually what really truly happened. Uh, there is no evidence in, from the suttas, from the word of the Buddha, that he actually did that. Uh, and that's what I take as the uh, gold standard for what is uh, real Buddhism. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's kind of my, my view of that. Uh, so I think this Pantasudrata translation here is, is pretty, pretty good, more accurate than most translations. Uh, so then the Buddha says, the Buddha TV says this beautiful, nice thing that I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what is liable to be reborn. Yeah, and we have just seen what all of those things are. These are, uh, you know, the wife or partner and children and animals and gold and all of these kind of things. Yeah. So the Buddha was just like us. He was also seeking for these things. And remember what seeking was defined as? It was defined as being attached to. Yeah being, what else this uh, attached to, tied to, and uh, not intoxicated. What was the, what was the word? Uh, whatever. It was roughly the same, same ballpark. Yeah. So yes, the Buddha, to be very much like us. Yeah, He was attached to the family members, the things that he owned. I, too, was seeking these things. And so this gives an idea that the Buddha is seeking these things. Yeah? This idea that you are a bodhisattva, if he really was a bodhisattva who was practicing for four incalculable eons, he was coming very, very close to the end. Yeah? You wouldn't expect him to have many attachments at this point. You would expect him to be almost awakened already. But no, he still has exactly the same kind of attachments. That doesn't speak, but if he had been practicing four incalculable eons and hadn't really got anywhere, then what is the point of those eons anyway? <laughs> so I think I prefer to kind of throw out that whole idea because it doesn't really fit with the way the suttas work. Yeah? He still basically has the ordinary problems of humanity. He hasn't really purified himself that deeply. He's, other places he said that he too occasionally would have ill will, have all of these kind of things. Yeah? So he wasn't fundamentally different from anyone else. Uh, that's kind of what is so interesting about this. Uh, so he too sought these things, uh, yeah? being himself liable to be to be reborn. Myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow. Yeah, sorrow, the Buddha to be was also sorrowing before his, uh, before his awakening. He's still liable to become corrupted, for goodness sake. Yeah, again, you would think that someone who had been going on for four incalculable eons wasn't really that liable to become corrupted uh, because if you are a bodhisattva, you're on the path. You have to, to become an awakened one, how can you be liable to become corrupted if you're on that path and you almost reach the end point? It doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't fit with the idea of the bodhisattva ideal. So again, it's, it's more like the Buddha is an ordinary human being who uh, you know, is still striving for these things. So the Buddha also has all these problems, the Buddha to be rather. And then he's seeking other things that are liable to the same things. Yeah, it's a bad idea he starts to realize, then it occurred to me, says the Buddha, why do I, being liable to be reborn, liable to grow old, liable to fall sick, liable to sow, liable to die, liable to become corrupted, seek things that have the same nature? Why indeed? What's the point? Yeah, you, you already have a big problem and then you seek other things. You're just, again, multiplying the problem. 
These other things, your kids might become corrupted, your wife might become corrupted, uh, they might die before you, especially in those days, lots of illnesses were available, they would sorrow, and when they sorrow, you sorrow, as often as like in a family life, right? Uh, or someone sorrows, you sorrow as well. Uh, and so he understands the problem with these things, uh, the multiplication of uh, bad things, basically, the multiplication of dukkha, that's what it is. Uh, dukkha, everyone understands dukkha? Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, dukkha is an e one word that we, everyone really needs to learn from Pali. Dukkha, 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 etc. So, um, yes, this is what he thinks. And then, of course, it, the next thought is, why don't I seek freedom from birth, freedom from old age, freedom from sickness, freedom from death, freedom from sorrow, freedom from corruption? the supreme sanctuary from bondage, extinguishment. If you look into your paper, into your paper, it says, uh, why don't I seek the unborn? Why don't I seek the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the un lack of old age and the unailing and the, the deathless and the sorrowless, etc. But this is my translation. I think this is a much better translation because it gets to the point of what is going on there. So I, um, I, I I don't think the other one is ideal, so I have changed it a little bit. Uh, yeah? So why don't I seek the freedom from these things? Uh, and this is the idea, because this is a problem. Uh, this is what the Buddha thinks. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is a difficult thought to have, right? Uh, because uh, most people in the world, they don't seek freedom from these things, because they don't think it's possible to have freedom from these things. Uh, so they don't even seek it, they don't even think about the possibility. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the problem. But the Buddha, of course, is, uh, this is kind of what makes the Buddha special, is that he does seek for the, what seems to be impossible for others. Uh, he seeks that, uh, because uh, this is kind of what makes you a Buddha, that you have this very powerful spiritual inclination. So uh, the Buddha, why don't I seek for these things? Uh, so you can see what is going on here. Can you see what is going on? Here? The first part, uh, what we have seen so far, is the arising of right view. Uh, yeah, the arising of right view is seeing the suffering in the world. Why do I seek all of these things that have problems in the world? Yeah, this is the understanding of death. It's a simple kind of right view, but nevertheless a very important one. So it is the arising of right view. And once that right view comes into place, understand more about the suffering of life, the next thing is right intention. And this is what we're seeing here. Why not I seek freedom from these things? Yeah. This is right intention arising. You want to look, you want to actually have a different purpose in life, a different goal, a different aim, because you understand that the ordinary way of living is not really all that satisfactory. So we can see here how the Noble Eightfold Path also is found in the life of the Buddha or the Buddha to be, and how it comes out of his experiences in this way. So why don't I seek the freedom from all of these things? And then, when he has thought of this, then sometime later, while still black-haired, blessed with youth, in the prime of life, yeah. so uh, when the uh, uh, Buddha-to-be, he was still uh, reasonably young, yeah, when, he became, when he decided to go forth. And so if you want to go forth, then go and check your hair, first of all. <laughs> Yes, it's good. To, it's, it, in other words, it's good to do it when you're young because you have more energy, you have more flexibility, you have more vitality. So the younger you are, the better it is. And, uh, and that's what the Buddha did. He was still young. He was quick to understand the problems of life. He didn't have to become old before he started to understand the problems. Yeah, so uh, don't wait till you have the cancer before you consider these things. Uh, do it before you get the cancer. Yeah, you know the cancer will come anyway, so you might as well kind of get going now. That's kind of the, the idea. And then, though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful uh, faces. So his mother and father didn't want him to go forth. Have you ever heard that before? Mother and father didn't want, to go, want the children to go forth. It's everywhere, yeah? It's everywhere the same. If you have very enlightened parents, your parents will say, please, go forth. Yeah, and for goodness sake, don't become a doctor, become a monk, much better. Yeah? That's what the parents will say if they're wise, but very few parents are that wise. 
They don't really understand what is really beneficial in this world. Uh, and kind of the parents of the Buddha are exactly the same. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, nothing has changed in the world. Uh, everything is the same. Uh, when, when I come to Malaysia, people tell me, oh, in Malaysia very difficult because your parents, they want you to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. They don't want you to become a monk. That's the last thing. Yeah, Monks and nuns are the bottom of the hierarchy. That's, of course, that's ridiculous, right? But monks and nuns are at the top of the hierarchy. That's this is kind of the reality of things. But this is not just Malaysia. This is in India, ancient India. When I became a monk, do you think my parents wanted me to become a monk? Of course not, right? That was the last thing my father said to me. I didn't bring you up to become a monk. <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> that's what he said. Because he didn't really know what it was. But once you understand what it is, yeah, once you understand that this is about the meaning of life, once you understand that as a monastic, if you practice well, you can make an end of suffering and you can take a lot of other people with you and you can advise people on the highest kind of meaning and happiness in the world, why should you not become a monk? Yeah. Okay, as a doctor, yeah, you can help other people. It is kind of status in society. Forget about this status nonsense anyway. Yeah. Leave that aside. This is, if a monastic life is well lived, lived with integrity, lived with insight into the teachings, there's nothing is higher than that. This is the best thing you can do with your life. Yeah. And so uh, please, if, if your children have, you know, if, if your children don't want to become monks, still tell them, please become a monk, yeah? Because this is the best, uh, yeah? That's kind of the right approach to these things. Uh. <laughs> so we need to, sometimes we need to think differently, yeah? Because everyone is just walking around, we're walking around blindly. Everyone is following, following someone else. Uh, and everyone says, oh yeah, you have to work, study really hard, and you have to become a doctor, you have to get married, get, make sure you get a good husband or wife, yeah, then have two and a half kids, yeah, get a kind of a nice house, and, like, yeah. and then, and, and it all sounds very purposeful, but then what happens? And then, and then you become a pensioner, and then you come to the BF to learn about the Buddhist teaching because you realize life is coming to an end. And then you die. And then you wonder, what was that all about anyway? Yes, I did exactly what everyone said. I became a doctor. I had two kids. I got married. I did all of that. But where did it get me? Nowhere. I still have to die at the end of the day. Everything I did in that life, I had to give it up. Why did I do these things? And when you die, you think you are kind of confused and you wonder, everyone gave you really bad advice, yeah? The reason they gave you the advice is because they were just following everyone else, everyone is following everyone else. No one is thinking for themselves. That is why we give this advice to the next generation. No one is really kind of taking an independent stance and saying, actually, maybe the Buddha was right, yeah? The Buddha is a real revolutionary. The Buddha is this incredibly awesome character in human history here, who thinks completely for himself, who goes outside, stands apart from the crowd and says, let me really look at life more neutrally here. That is what the Buddha does. And then we should listen to someone like that. Some of the most interesting people in the history of humanity are the people who dare to take a stand on moral grounds, take a stand on truth, stand up against authority, stand up against the habits of society, yeah? These are the people we really admire. Isn't that true? Yeah, these are the people who really are awesome. People like Gandhi, yeah, in India, who stood up against kind of, you know, the, the British at that time, yeah, who were kind of colonial kind of headmasters or whatever. These are the really powerful people. Uh, the people not afraid of kind of the powers, because the power is often corrupt, uh, and the Buddha was maybe the most important example of that in human history, standing up against the Brahmanical culture, thinking completely for himself. Uh, then there is a chance we will find happiness. Uh, but if we just go follow along like a sheep, bah, bah, then what happens? We follow the sheep to the edge of the cliff, and we go over the edge of the cliff as well. Uh, and we just bang. We kind of, that's it. Uh, do you want to go over that cliff, or do you want to not go over that cliff? That's my question uh, so uh, my point is here that uh, the Buddha to be had the same problem as everyone else has. Uh, he had to go against the current, uh, yeah, even though his mother and father wished otherwise. Uh, and this is actually a very important point also historically, because uh, uh, very often when you hear about the biography of the Buddha to be, uh, 
very often you hear the story about the Buddha kind of saying goodbye to his wife and son that night, okay, by their sleeping. He gets on the horse Kantaka and he rides out of the city, jumping over the city wall, this enormous city called Kapilavatu, yeah, and then he rides off into the sunset. Or, or, or that's kind of like a bit like a cowboy movie, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but actually, this is not what happened because these are the suttas. If any, this is actually what happened, yeah. He spoke to his mother and father, yeah? Obviously, otherwise they wouldn't have the chance to wish otherwise. Obviously, he must have spoken with them. And they were crying, yeah? They were really distraught, the fact that he was leaving. Yeah? And uh, obviously, he had secured yeah, a future for his wife and for his child. Uh, this was the, would have been part of the package. So he wasn't, uh, uh, he, 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 he was, um, you know, he, he did what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, yeah, he, he was... Um, uh, responsible. He wasn't irresponsible, as some people say. Yeah? And so this is the reality of what happened there. So uh, this is kind of nice, yeah, to know kind of more historically what actually is more likely to be the real historical events. Yeah? <laughs> so what happened then? So his father, mother and father wished otherwise. I shaved off my hair and beard, it dressed in ochre robes. Uh, and went forth from lay life to homelessness. So this is when the right intention kind of reaches its maximum point, uh, when you become a monastic, yeah? So the Buddha became a monastic. Yeah? So this is the right intention from the monastic kind of point of view. Yeah? And then he goes forth, and it is all driven by this idea of uh, uh, death and the problems of life, essentially. Yeah? So... There you are. Let's uh, do a little bit more meditation together. Okay, okay. So, any um, comments on the noble search or anything else that we have been talking about? Uh, yes. Uh, Ajahn, this. Um, Majjhima Nikaya 26 uh, is a very lengthy sutta. No? Mm. Uh, is there any special reason why a major part of it was being omitted? The, you know, the subsequent part where Buddha was seeking enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, why, what, is there any reason why the part is omitted from the study today? Ah, it's just because I, I choose those things that are relevant. Yeah, so this... Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the name of this course is the idea of uh, developing perceptions like the Buddha, seeing the world like the Buddha. And so this particular part here shows you how the Buddha to be developed his perception before his awakening. Uh, so it focuses on that part of it. Uh, so I'm just taking those bits and pieces that are you know, relevant to this particular course. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, yeah. And sometimes I do more. I, I have in the past, I have done larger parts of the sutta. And uh, I sometimes I do the whole sutta. But... Uh, a sutta like this, you know, you need a whole course just to do the one sutta, you know, so you kind of, you only get one sutta done. So you have to have a special course on the sutta, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, so it takes, takes a lot of time. So we have to, sometimes you just have to make choices. Choices are harder. So, uh, yeah. Afternoon, Ajahn, many thanks for your teachings. Um, so we do understand intellectually very deeply that um, uh, our spouses, our children, our wealth, our degrees or whatever, mm. uh, they're all liable to corruption mm. and they're not ours, ours. Um, but still there is that deep-seated attachment in the sense that when we actually land up losing them yeah. in any way, it causes a lot of suffering. Yeah. The suffering is a bit less because we intellectually understand a little bit of Rai Lakana, but not really. It's not visceral with us. And as you've been saying for so many years that keep on listening to dhammas so that it brainwashes you uh, or, you know, obviously meditating so that you can penetrate the truth. Yeah. Um, but most of us uh, have not reached those jhanic levels where we can actually penetrate the truth. Mm. So it's mostly intellectual for us. Mm. Uh, and as you just mentioned uh, that uh, this may change from time to time. Next lifetime, we may not have access to Buddha's teachings. Mm. 
and we may be so uh, powerfully conditioned uh, by what is happening in that lifetime that we just actually keep on doing bad karmas mm. and then that keeps on proliferating and next lifetime because you know the further b- bad karmas that proliferates into further so in the sense you keep on roaming about in samsara um and as you've just mentioned buddha obviously had a lot of insight obviously um so you know he took to um this when he was young mm. um and most of us realize this when when we have already old frail have suffered a lot and it kind of is a bit disappointing because we don't know how much time we have and possibly very less now um and you know uh even though we are trying our level best uh it is not best enough i mean it's not good enough i feel um uh, and this make kind of get lost because the the part mm. the seating is there but you know it may just go either ways so yeah. how to kind of uh, you know uh, <laughs> get over this and yeah. like there's no way you can make sure that you don't continue around this are till you actually are a short uh, stream winner so you can't be a sota tana this is not for people like us i guess yeah. uh, so uh, what do you advise ajman thank you <laughs> yeah i you know this is uh, it is true what you're saying you know this is lena is all right from uh, from melbourne okay great okay nice to have you here um yeah It, you know this is true and i think this is true not only for lay people but actually true for the majority of monastics as well you know that uh, you don't really have that kind of power to really you don't have the inspiration to, to carry forward and to do the right thing and to live the life fully and this is true of course it's true for the majority of monastics uh, and they live lives that are not really compatible with taking the dhamma to the deepest level uh, just as with lay people uh, and uh, so uh, but the very fact that you have that understanding means that that actually already is a useful understanding because that very understanding gives sense to a rise of urgency if you feel a little bit of despair how am i going to get this to work right uh, that actually is helpful already because it actually kind of moves you in the right direction uh, so uh, the, the problem is that um, the, the issue for many people is that you know we have put ourselves in a position uh, Where we, ha- where we don't have all that much freedom anymore uh, yeah we as you know when you are living a family life and you have all of these things uh, all of these responsibilities then uh, you can't just just leave them and say i'm going to go and walk into the forest and disappear forever after you can't just can't do that uh, even though <laughs> you might want that uh, and so you ha- always have to compromise a little bit uh, so you have to make the very best use of the time that you have that's really all you can do uh, and there's, there isn't really any much any other any any other way of doing it uh, and uh, i think very often you know one of the things where we kind of go wrong on the buddhist path is uh, not also or not um, there's two two reasons why we should read the sutta as if we should listen to dhamma talks uh, one is to kind of straighten our views our views get more 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 clear because we underestimate the power of right view it's actually really important uh, how long are you here for you know you uh, really okay okay <laughs> okay okay that's very good you can this evening i'm going to talk more about right view the power of right view so please come please come this evening as well don't disappear this evening <laughs> and right view is actually incredibly powerful because if you really the more you this is what you are saying now comes from right view yeah this is why you feel in these things so this shows that right view is already penetrating it's already having an impact on you and that means that actually you will it will affect you in a positive way it is already going in the right direction and i will talk more about that this evening how that right view enhances your morality your meditation practice and everything in your life as a consequence so right view is very important the other thing that is really important is to be inspired to do the practice you know despair is not enough you also have to kind of despair has to be channeled in a way where it actually leads to action and that action usually comes comes out of being inspired by these teachings and this is what i love about ajahn brahm i can listen to ajahn brahm and even though i've heard everything he says before uh, there's something about the way he says it uh, that makes it inspiring regardless uh, i can listen to the same thing 10000 times and maybe because i'm slightly brain damaged but uh, i can <laughs> but I, i i can and i still get inspired it has to do with the quality the way that he says things yeah you are in his presence and you just it's like you f- almost feel the dhamma is tangible yeah and this is what inspires you so this is two things on the one hand being reminded again and again and again of right view what action that this is urgent yeah there is grounds for a little bit of despair but not paralyzing despair but activating despair that makes you actually do something in this path 
And so you just have to keep going like that. Uh, I don't think there is anything else to do, really, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, they make the best of the time that we have here. Yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. Good afternoon, ma'am. Earlier you mentioned Upa Kilesa. Yeah. Uh, I am confused Upa Kilesa and Kilesa. Upa Kilesa has got 16 defilements. Mm. And it, to me, it sounds the same as Kilesa. Mm. So can uh, Ajahn please uh, explain? Okay, so <clears throat> it's, it's interesting they, because uh, in the modern day, people often use the word kilesa. You go to Thailand and say kilet, kilet. Is that right, Venerable? I don't know. <laughs> Thailand is say kilet, is that right? Kilesa? Kilet, okay, kilet. So close enough. I, I can't get it properly, the Thai pronunciation exactly right, but uh, something like that. It basically, it is just the Thai pronunciation of kilesa. And you travel around the Buddhist world and many people use the word kilesa. And it's kind of interesting that a lot of the ways that we speak about the Dhamma in the contemporary world, yeah, they, it is, comes from the commentaries, uh, this commentarial Dhamma very often. And the reason why the word kilesa is used so much in the world is because that is the word that most often occurs in the commentaries. Uh, yeah? Whereas in the suttas, it's upa kilesa or san kilesa. There is a few occasions where kilesa occurs in the suttas, but actually it's quite rare. Yeah, it is mostly a commentarial term. And so why do we then use the word kilesa? As a, well, the reason is because we are influenced by the commentaries. People read the Visuddhimagga. That's where they take the information from. That's only one example. Another example is the, my favorite example of the third, how many parts of the body are there? And people always say 32 parts of the body. But actually, no, in the commentaries, there's 32 parts. In the suttas, there's only 31. And if you get that wrong, you can't get enlightened. <laughs> no, I'm being naughty. Of course you can. It doesn't make any difference at all. It makes no difference. 31, 33, whatever. Yeah? But uh, the point is just that you can see it. We're getting our information from the commentaries rather than from the suttas. Uh, usually you talk about people about samadhi, and they will talk about samadhi, talk about upachara samadhi, and appana samadhi. Again, it's called, it's, that's from the Commentaries in the suttas is called jhana or just samadhi, right? So a lot of the way we talk about the dhamma comes actually from the commentaries rather than from the from the suttas, and that's kind of interesting. So in the suttas, basically it's called upakilesa, and the commentary is called kilesa, but basically the meaning is the same. Uh, the uh, five, the five hindrances, for example, are called upakilesas in the suttas in certain places. And then you have the uh, Upakilesas of the Upakilesa Sutta, yeah, which are 10 or something like that, I think, there. And then you have the Upakilesa Sutta of the simile of the cloth in the Majjhimanikai 7. It's also called Upakilesa. It's a long list of Kilesas again. Uh, so it means basically just defilements of the mind. Uh, very often it means the ref very refined ones that come at the very end of the path. Uh, but essentially it means just defilements of the mind. Uh, and sometimes also the three root defilements, often called the Hetus, uh, in the Pali, hetu means like uh, cause, causal, or roots. Yeah, the co co kind of the cause things like uh, lobadosa moha. Yeah, also called uh, they're called kilesas on a, on a few occasions. Uh, basically, it comes down to the same thing. Yeah, yeah these are, are kind of refined defilements of the mind. Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, Ajahn. Uh, Ajahn, the, uh, the hagiography of uh, the Buddha leaving the palace, uh, sneaking out in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if that, that story was taken from the uh, Kandaka chapter 1, where the story of Yasa, it seems almost similar, the fashion is almost similar that uh, he, he left the palace and saw uh, uh, the musician, female musicians uh, sleeping in a disgraceful manner, then he quite distressed. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point because uh, these stories, they come from somewhere. Uh, and that may be the earliest occurrence. That's a good, very good, good point. <clears throat> and they have used that as a template for the story of the Buddha later on. I think that's probably, probably quite conceivable. Uh, 
and they uh, and then they added other elements like the horse can the can these kind of things added on top of that. Uh, that's an interesting point. I think may, very well maybe there may be some uh, some truth to that. You know that they had taken some of those elements. Uh, I think that's quite likely. Uh, um, yeah. In the suttas, what you find, uh, you find don't find very much information at all about the early life of the Buddha to be. You find a little bit about uh, he had like three houses uh, when he was young. Yeah, one for the rainy season, one for the winter season, one for the summer season. You find that uh, in the uh, Sukumala Sutta, Anguttara three is thirty nine. You find that uh, that is similar to Yasa in some ways, uh, but it doesn't have all the extra kind of things. Uh, actually, there too you have the idea of. of uh, Female musicians, you know, being entertained by female musicians, actually is found there as well uh, in the Sukumala Sutta. Uh, so there, some of those elements are already found there. Uh, but the idea of leaving in the kind of leaving in the middle of the night as disappearing, that's actually only found with the story of Yasa, uh, as you quite rightly. Yes, this is an interesting point. It shows you how elements are used and reused and then move from one place to another one. It shows you how the stories come about a little bit. So. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Ajahn, uh, it seems that uh, this, the way in which it's described, it looks like the path is kind of the path that is being been mentioned here. It's meant for people who actually think quite a bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah. So so it's like you know you gotta think and consider and then think and then yeah. Then you consider the pros and cons and then you sort of. So yeah. what, if, what if what if we are not brought up in a culture where we are, we are, we are thinking <laughs> or, or we are not being used to the thinking? You know, and we're just following along. Following along. And, yeah. And you know, living life. So this is a very yeah. very rare case of people who are, who are you know who are thinking about these things. Yeah, I, I think I think probably all cultures have a similar kind of problem. You know that uh, there isn't enough thinking and too much following along. I think it's probably found everywhere. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, but thinking is actually an important part of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, yeah, reflecting first of all, hearing the word of the Buddha and reflecting on the word of the Buddha, asking yourself what does it mean for me? How does it apply in my life? Uh, and then kind of rectifying your views, rectifying your understanding based on that. Uh, so reflection is a very important part of this. Uh, but uh, reflection and contemplation doesn't necessarily mean a lot of thinking. It's not like you have to kind of think, think, think. Yeah? It often just means contemplating something, yeah? thinking, hmm, what, is, what does this mean? Some, and sometimes the, the light bulb just goes on because you have a clear mind. Sometimes too much verbalizing in your mind is just a sign of... Uh, not a sign of really thinking, it's just a sign of uh, habit, yeah, kind of the mind going round and round in circles. So, so often it's more like just considering things, yeah, oh, that's interesting, considering it in a, in a kind of new light, in a new way, and not following along. Yeah. So you're right, I think, um, I think all, everyone in this world, we all should consider things, yeah, we should try to step out, a little bit out of our culture, a bit outside of the habits that we have, outside of... Uh, the, uh, the conditioning and not just take things for granted uh, because, uh, uh, you know, you look around society, uh, most people, are they, how happy are they? Not necessarily all that happy, yeah, and it, uh, do I want to become exactly like my parents? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, right? Okay, you, you may have good parents, but you can also see that they probably not exactly like them, yeah, you, because your parents, well, they will be, they, they have probably done a lot of good for you, but also you can see the limitations in the life they've had. Uh, yeah? And if I think to myself, do I want to become exactly like my parents? No, don't want to become exactly like them. Yeah? <laughs> because you see, you, you know them very well, you know the limits, you know the problems, you know the issues, uh, and you don't want to be exactly like that. Uh, and so this is the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves. Uh, and the tendency is that we do become like our parents. Uh, if you follow the same track because you've inher inherited, you know, the genes, you have inherited, you have learned a lot from them. So the tendency is that you become roughly like them. Huh? So if you don't want to become like them, well, you have to step, do things differently. You have to think about things in a different way. Huh? Otherwise, you do the same thing. Huh? Sometimes I look at my brother and sister and both my sister, while well, she's no longer there, but, uh, you know, while she was married and she had two kids, my brother is married, has two children. Do I want to be like them? Huh? 
No. <laughs> my brother and sister are great people. Don't misunderstand. They are really good people. There. My brother is probably, probably my best friend outside, outside of monasticism. Well, even, yeah, I don't, yeah. So he's one of my very closest friends. And he's a great guy in many ways. But do I want to be married and have kids in that way? No, absolutely not. It's the last thing I want to do, yeah? I can see, you can see how confining it is, how trapping it is, how it forces you to kind of very hard to get out of your habits because you are surrounded by a certain society, a certain family, which kind of forces you to think in a certain way all the time. It's very hard to withdraw, very hard to find that freedom and liberation. And, and the, the woman that, that he is married to, is she okay? She's okay, but would I want to be married to someone like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not because anything is wrong. I probably the person I want to be married to probably doesn't exist if I was going to be married, right? That's kind of the thing. This, there is no such person anyway. And uh, so it's like, uh, and this is actually very useful because we tend to become like our family members. Uh, I would probably end up a bit like my brother or my sister, uh, but I don't want to do that. So, okay, I better do, take a different route. And uh, so, yeah, so we need to step outside of our immediate environment and think about things uh, in a different way. Otherwise, we're going to be trapped just like everyone else. So, um, 